prison is, the, is not good for anyone. Um, if you take roughly two purposes of prison, one is to punish and the other is to rehabilitate, um, the more rehabilitation you do, the, the less traumatic prison is in someone's life and the better they are when they come out. Until the 1970s, rehabilitation was at least a important uh, function of prisons. In the 1970s, something happened, and that is um, crowding. The prison population today is 10 times what it was in 1970. Over two and a half million people in, in jail and prison today, and back then there was one-tenth as many. Um, the other thing that happened is the conservative forces in the country were very anti-prisoner, and they were using, they were villainizing prisoners and saying that these are awful people and they don't deserve to have rehabilitation. So rehabilitation programs were cut. Um, what happened is that an experience that would be hard anyway of being isolated and separated from loved ones and out of the community and, and having to do one's time became much, much worse with crowding. So for instance, gymnasiums, which used to be used for basketball and volleyball, were taken over as dormitories and they would put 150 or 250 people in the gymnasium in bunk beds. In California, they're three high. So you're always crowded. And we have a lot of research that what crowding does to people is it causes an increase in tempers, an increase in violence, an increase in psychiatric breakdown, an increase in suicide, and an increase in any medical condition that's psychologically uh, influenced. For instance, hypertension, ulcers, skin conditions, all of those things get worse with crowding. Well, the crowding just kept getting worse and worse. And at the same time, they were dismantling the rehabilitation because the right-wing politicians were saying this is coddling prisoners. And so they destroyed a lot of the education programs and job training so that people would be, first of all, having a horrible experience in prison where there were more fights, there were more rapes, there was just harder, life was harder. And then they wouldn't be prepared when they got out. And that went on through the 70s and 80s increasingly until it reached a point that the prisons were out of control. And in the 80s, there were a lot of protests in prisons that the media called riots, but actually they were legitimate protests. And um, the violence was out of control. I call that a historic wrong turn because what the authorities decided to do was to blame the prisoners for this, not to talk about crowding, not to talk about taking away rehabilitation, but to say we've got a worse brand of prisoners here and we have to lock them down. So they started to use segregation more for more of the prisoners and for longer terms. It always was in prison that there was a hole and you could go to the hole, which was segregation for 10 days or 30 days for getting into a fight in the yard or something. Now what they started doing, and it started with the Adjustment Center at San Quentin in California, is they start putting people in the hole permanently. That is, they just take a group of people who they're afraid of, and they put them in segregation long term. In the 80s, they started talking about doing supermax prisons, which is entire prisons or entire prison cell blocks entirely for segregation. And they put who they called the worst of the worst there. They really weren't the worst of the worst. They were wrong on a bunch of levels, and I think King has a lot to say about that. But they, they put people they were afraid of, basically, in segregation long term. Now we had two, three factors. One was the crowding, which causes very detrimental psychiatric uh, effects. Second was the dismantling of rehabilitation. Uh, I call it the decimation of life skills, and I consider it a form of torture. That is, they take away someone's capacity to function out in the world, which is totally contrary to thinking about a department of corrections. They don't correct, they break people. And then the third thing is they took an increasing proportion of people and put them into the hole permanently. And that just had devastating psychological effects. They tend to select populations who are quite other than the worst of the worst. For instance, uh, when I started touring these supermax prisons, which was Pelican Bay in the, in the early 90s, I found half of the prisoners were suffering from serious mental illness and were not getting mental health treatment. Internationally, when you deny mental health treatment to people with serious mental illness, that's considered torture. So in all of the supermaxes around the country, there were 25, 50, sometimes 75% of the prisoners in segregation in the supermax were suffering from serious mental illness.
The other people they put in there is any kind of politically conscious prisoner. And the reason is not because they break rules, because they tend not to break rules, but because they're afraid of them. That is that the way that they educate the other prisoners um, puts fear in the, in the authorities who want to lock people down and disappear people behind bars. So uh, various uh, religious groups like the Muslims are overrepresented. African Americans and Latinos are overrepresented in segregation. It's interesting when you go into a prison, and I tour entire prisons in the course of doing expert witnessing in, in class action litigation. I go into the segregation unit, supermax or administrative segregation, and it's mostly people of color. Then I go into the mental health treatment unit or the shops where they train people to use uh, construction equipment and such, mostly white. It's just blatant racism that you see right when you walk into a prison. Like you said, what they do is they, um, they demoralize uh, and the prisoner simply because when the, when, the, when, 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 when the prisoner is constantly told that he's the worst of the worst, and she's the worst of the worst. It's a possibility that that person can become exactly what they say that they are. And the thing with me was, uh, I was doing my best to make them out alive. I did my best while I was there to try to litigate in the federal court. We filed a lot of lawsuits uh, in an attempt to get them to change that environment because at one time, the place where we were kept close cell restriction um, until the early 70s, about 72, um, they used to open the door that were 15 minutes into it, and they just used to open the cell door, just let everybody out for one hour. And we had a 10 minutes grace period to get the stuff together to go back in your cell, but a couple of years later, so they changed that to one man per hour. And what that did, that not only did that, that lent the day, uh, but it cut down on people communicating, coming together. After a while, when they closed the cell and, and, and individualized it, sometimes the officer would, you know, and as a uh, result of constantly telling people, well, you are under security, but you can't be uh, allowed together, you have to be alone, you have to, when you are good, you have to be shackled, you have to be handcuffed, everywhere you go, this, this is the way it is. And with, with, with this, guys who had formerly lived on the tier with each other, who embraced each other, who friend every now and then there were an argument, but there were always people there to break it up. These guys here, you know, after a, a period of time, they would not be, they would not allow themselves to be in close proximity unless, with another prisoner, unless that prisoner was shackled and handcuffed. Because they had been conditioned to be around another prisoner, because who formerly, they used to embrace, be out in the hall with that entire period, that whole hour, and, and associated and had good connection with. But now, uh, after a while, they have been trained and taught that, well, you can't live with this individual. And a lot of people, a lot of prisoners, succumb to this concept that they can't not live, you know, unless they come in contact, because I've heard uh, guys say, you know, sometimes the officer would make a mistake, and I use that quotation, make a mistake and open two, three doors. And I hear guys standing in their doorway, why are you opening my door? You trying to get me killed? On the other hand, when they open my door, I would run out myself. And if it was anybody else out in the hall, I would embrace them. I would say, come on, man, we could, we could live together. We don't, you know, they have trained us. I say, I, because I had been trying to, to fight the courts. Uh, Polo Zola, he was the head judge, and uh, he got to be the head judge, he was a magistrate, but he got to be the head judge, and I've I written him individual letters, I, uh, I had uh, filed many lawsuits about the condition in Angola, along with some other folks, but I had appeared before him several times, and uh, I, had, I had letters brought to Katrina, Katrina from him, poisoning letters from him, you know, telling me uh, how the, the prison system was, and how many inmates, even though I was claiming that you know, um, uh, this was dehumanizing. There were many prisoners who written him letters and who would, I, have, I didn't read those letters, but were telling him that that was a good thing. They, would, they loved this, being isolated and so forth and so on, but the majority of the prisoners did not like that. But even those who admitted or say that they like 
began to like being isolated and alone, it was a conditioning thing that occurred. They were conditioned to, to accept uh, that type of uh, environment. And it happens that it dehumanizes you. It, it's incremental, it creeps up on you. After a while, you just succumb uh, to the philosophy uh, of, uh, of, of the prison, and how the prison is reigned. You, you, you co-opt that, uh, or what they want, you co-opt that attitude and you act that way.